Good morning, everybody. We're glad you're here. Glad you can join us this morning for church. Welcome. Um, just a reminder, the, uh, we're not passing the plate for the offering, so the plates are at the back door. And you could, if you have anything you want to contribute to donate, you can do that on the way out. We're going to take some time again this morning to share some testimonies. So if you have a story for, of God's uh, faithfulness and what he's done in your life over these last number of months, gives us a chance to kind of catch up with each other and get to see what's going on in, in your lives. Um, we'll do that about halfway through the service. You can come to this area here. The, the podium is there to kind of keep you distance from the microphone. And uh, yeah, we'd be glad to hear what uh, the Lord is doing in your life. So feel free to do that when the time comes. And I think that's all I need to tell you right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have this opportunity to come together. After we've been apart for so long, I thank you, Lord, that even though there are restrictions and we're not doing things exactly the way we did, we've done them before, we uh, thank you that we can still come together and uh, encourage each other and worship together and to hear from your word in person. Lord, I just pray that you would be with each one of us that you would help us, Lord, to examine ourselves this morning, that you would forgive us, Lord, of, of the things that we have done that have hurt you and have hurt others and have hurt ourselves. And you forgive us for the things that we failed to do that you may have wanted us to do to bless others. Pray, Father, for your mercy and your grace to fall upon us. Thank you, Lord, for your death on the cross that provides the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace that we so desperately need. I pray, Lord, that you would just be with our family members, that you would protect those who um, are not near us and maybe in other places in, in the country or the world where the virus may be more difficult, and I just pray that you would protect them and watch over them. We pray for our family members who don't know you, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to show in word and in deed your love and how much you want them to be a part of your family. Help us to be faithful in prayer. Help us to say the right words at the right time. Give us discernment, Lord, for family and for friends as well. Be with those in our church who can't be here this morning because of illness or because of their, their own health kind of makes them want to feel that they need to stay home. I pray, Lord, that you would meet them where they are, that they would have church with you this next hour, that they would know and sense your presence, that they would be able to take advantage of what's available online or, or just spend time with you. Father, we just ask that you would uh, speak to us through the readings, through the psalms, through the scripture, through the testimonies, through, the, through your word, and that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, what you're saying to us. And give us the courage we need to act on your word when we leave this place. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So because the uh, health guidelines are discouraging us from singing together indoors, who would have ever thought singing indoors would be a scary thing? Because of that, um, I'm going to just sing a solo this morning. And because we're not supposed to sing together, and some of us just really, really, really want to sing, it seemed like a good idea to, uh, to start with songs that you guys don't know. So you will not be tempted to start singing along. So that, in, in turn, actually gave me an excuse to, uh, to sing a song that I wrote, because I know you don't know this one. I very much doubt that you've ever heard it before. It's a song that's based on Psalm 121. And Psalm 121 reminds us to, no matter what difficult times we're going through, what struggles we have, to look up and to see that there is one who sends us help in our difficult times. 
So this is my interpretation of Psalm 121. You will be walking through the noonday glare Because you've got to get from here to there And the heat will be a pillow heavy pressed against your face Your gaze will drop down to your stumbling feet where your own shadow will be a scant relief from the sun that keeps on beating, beating, beating every place, and you're all alone. Lift your eyes to the path that makes a way out of the wilderness. Lift your eyes to the low green You're moving ever forward, ever wondering, where does my help come from? You will be walking through the midnight black. You will feel creeping up behind your back. That old Scimitar moon hanging above you by a thread. Darkness before you will be a curtain drear, hiding and hinting at everything you fear. In the corner of your eye, the shadows dance a dance of dread, and you're all alone. Lift your eyes to the path that makes a way out of the wilderness. Lift your eyes to the low green hills not so far beyond. Lift your eyes to the mountain that keeps you moving ever forward. Does my help come from? Maybe he'll send your help rolling down the mountainside like thunder. Maybe he'll send your help swelling like the ocean up from under. and wings spread an angel army oh just maybe just maybe just maybe he'll just send me lift your eyes to the path that makes a way out lift your eyes to the low green hill not so far lift your eyes to the mountain that keeps you moving ever forward ever wondering where does my help come from Psalm 121 is one of those ones that sometimes is somebody's favorite. You know, ask them, what is your favorite psalm? And, and Psalm 121 is one of those ones. And Psalm 23 is another one. And it's good to remind ourselves that this book in the Bible that we call the Book of Psalms is, we call it a book of poetry, but in fact it is a book of lyrics, of song lyrics that were written for people not that different from us, long, long time ago, to sing together 
when they came together to worship God. Now, we're not going to sing Psalm 23 this morning. We are going to speak it, and we're going to speak it twice. The first time, we're just going to, uh, to read it through. The words will be on the screen. Next one, next one, next one. There we go. Um, we're going to read them together. And then the second time we come through the lyric, the words, they'll just be, just be like a, a slide with a picture on the screen. And we're going to do something a little bit different. I will read a phrase and I will model a motion for us to do. Because we can't sing with our voices, but we can sing with our bodies. And I know this is different, but I want to encourage you to give it a try. Go for it. We're not filming you. Nobody will see. It's good. So the first time, we'll just read it all through. And the second time, just repeat after me. OK? All right, let's read together the words that are on the screen. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay, Let's repeat after me. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing that I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I will fear no danger. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff They comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Well done. Thanks, guys. Let me read to you a story from the Old Testament from the book of Genesis, starting at chapter 25, and starting at verse 19. Yes, verse 19. So this is the account of the family of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padan Haram, the sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. The babies, plural, jostled together 
jostled with each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were two boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And that is why he was also called Edom. And Jacob rep uh, replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob, Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. And so Esau despised his birthright. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the stories of the Old Testament. Though they happened thousands of years ago, they teach us something about what we need to learn about ourselves today. And I pray, Lord, that in these next few minutes, as we look at the story of Esau, that uh, you would speak to our lives. You would overlay it over our own circumstances and teach us what we need to know. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time It's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the story of our scripture passage today is about two brothers, two twin brothers, Two twin brothers who were competitive with each other from the moment they left the womb. Esau was the twin who was born first. And in the culture that they were born into, uh, being the firstborn was something very significant. And we'll take a look more about that in a few minutes. Jacob was born second. He wasn't the firstborn, but it wasn't through lack of effort. The Bible tells us that as Esau left the womb, Jacob had a tight grip on Esau's heel, as if, almost as if to say, oh, no, you don't. Get back in here. I'm going out first. Despite his efforts, Jacob was born second and would not be entitled to the birthright that belonged to the firstborn of every family in their culture. Now, what is a birthright? The dictionary tells us that it is a right that someone has because they were born into a particular position in society, into a particular family, a particular geographic place. A birthright can also mean something that, that every human has by virtue of the fact that we were born and it's a right that belongs to all people. Now in Jacob and Esau's culture, the first definition was probably more likely to apply. A birthright such as the one bestowed upon Esau has to do with position, has to do with inheritance. Upon his father's death, Esau, as the firstborn, would inherit a double portion of his father's estate. He would inherit twice what his siblings would inherit. And not only is the birthright a matter of inheritance, but it's a matter of position. Esau would eventually become the head of the family with all the authority, all the privilege, and all the responsibilities that go with it. And as Jacob and Esau were descendants of Abraham, part of God's chosen people, Esau would also, as part of his birthright, be placed in a special covenant relationship with the Lord God. He would be given an opportunity to know God in a unique and intimate way that would not be fully available to his siblings. So Esau had a birthright by virtue of being born a few seconds ahead of Jacob. Now, we in our culture don't really use the language of birthright very often, especially as it pertains to our family dynamics. 
But I would suggest that each and every one of us has a birthright that's probably more in line with the second definition. We have a birthright that is common to every human being on earth. Some people don't even know that they have this birthright. Others realize they have it and just kind of dismiss it. Still others attempt to live in that birthright and at some point they find it too hard and they give up. And others do all that they can to live out that birthright. So what is our birthright? What are those things that we share with every other breathing human being? Well, first we are all given the birthright of the opportunity for a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. The Westminster Catechism says that the chief end of humans is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We were created to be in a relationship with God, a relationship that is for God's glory, and at the same time, a relationship that is for our good. We were created for a relationship with God that would bring us great joy, bring us great fulfillment, a relationship that would fill what one philosopher called the God-shaped void, the God-shaped hole within each of our lives. We find our birthright as well in the blessings and the gifts God has given us. He's given each one of us talents and gifts and abilities, and he's given them to us for a reason. They are our birthright, and we have the responsibility to make the most of the gifts and talents and abilities that we've been given. We also find our birthright in the place in this world that we've been given. We are placed in Port Hope, Ontario, Canada for a reason. And we find our birthright, and we find our birthright in the purpose for living that God has given us. None of us is an accident. We are not here by random chance. God has created each one of us for a purpose. And part of our birthright is to fulfill that purpose by, by working with the Holy Spirit to discern what that purpose is for our own unique context and to rely on the strength of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the purpose that God has given us. And I think that each of these, I think that some of these general concepts of what a birthright is also applied to Esau's situation. As firstborn, Esau had the opportunity for a special covenant relationship with the Lord. As part of the direct line of Abraham, God had a special purpose for Esau's life. And he was blessed with many gifts, not the least of which was the ability to hunt and to bring food home for his family. Esau was the stereotypical outdoorsman. He would much rather be out in the wilds hunting game than, than doing any work around the house. And because of that, Esau was, was favored by his father above Jacob because his father loved the wild game that, and the meat that, that Esau brought home. Jacob, on the other hand, was more domestic. He could cook up a mean stew out of all the beef that, uh, and the meat that, that Esau brought home. And Jacob was more the apple of his mom's eye. Which brings us to that fateful day when Esau had been out in the wilds hunting game. He wasn't as successful this day, and that prompted him to stay out longer than he normally would have and in hopes of bagging that one last big catch. And finally, Esau decided that he had had enough, and he returned home tired, exhausted, and completely famished. He was hungry. And as he approached the family encampment, he could smell the aroma of the stew that Jacob was cooking up. And he approached Jacob in the stew pot, and with all the politeness that brothers often have for each other, he looked at Jacob and said, hey, give me some of that. I'm starving, give me the stew. Now Jacob was a conniver. He always had a plan, he was always trying to to sneak around and, and get things for himself. He was like that from birth, when he tried to, to connive his way past Jacob in the birth canal even. And he spent much of his younger years trying to figure out ways to, to gain the family birthright that he felt should have been rightfully his. And as a professional conniver, he saw an opportunity right here to give it another shot. He says, I'll give you some stew, Esau, 
but you got to pay me something. And so Esau reached in his pocket to pull out a toonie, but Jacob stopped him and said, I don't want money. Sell me your birthright in exchange for this bowl of stew. Now, at this point, Esau engaged in some logic that we, with the benefit of hindsight many years later, and with the benefit of a full stomach, would conclude that his logic was faulty. But apparently, it made sense to Esau at the time. And he said, hey, I'm going to die anyway if I don't get something to eat soon. What good is a birthright to me if I'm dead? The birthright is yours. Hand over the stew, little brother. Ah, ah, ah. Not so fast, big brother, countered Jacob. How do I know you won't change your mind once you're not hungry anymore? Swear an oath to me that you have given me your birthright. So Esau swore the oath, grabbed some bread and stew, gobbled it down in record time, downed it with some water, let out a belch, and got up and left. And the Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. Why did Esau do that? Why did he give up something that seemed obviously to be extremely important and he gave it up in exchange for a simple meal? Honestly, I, we shouldn't be so harsh and so hard on Esau. After all, all we humans have been given a birthright by God. And yet so many of us in society are willing to sell it off in exchange for so little. Maybe if we take a look at some of Esau's possible motivations, we can also see them in ourselves. And perhaps we can do something about it before we end up walking away, leaving our birthright behind beside an empty bowl. I think one reason Esau sold his birthright was that he was living only in the now. He was very short-sighted. He, he, he didn't value long-term thinking. He saw a need that he had in the present. He saw a desire that he had in the present. And he decided to reach out and grab the thing that met his need, even if it cost him his future. And we can often be like that. We get impatient. We see something we could have now, and even though reaching out for it too soon might have a negative impact on our future, we reach out and take it anyway. We can get impatient waiting on God's timing. Or we look at what's happening in our own personal corner of the world and figure that if, if anything is going to happen, well, then I'd better make it happen myself because God it seems to be just taking his time. He's not doing anything. Popular Christian speaker and entertainer when I was young was a fellow named Mike Warnke. And I had the chance to see him live a couple of times in Montreal. And I'll always remember his definition of sin. He said, sin is taking something for ourselves in our own timing and in our own way that God wants us to have anyway, but in his timing, in his way. Sometimes sin is reaching out for the wrong thing, but sometimes sin is reaching out for the right thing at the wrong time. And like Esau, we humans can be very short-sighted. We can walk away from that birthright of an opportunity that God gives us to really know him and to walk with him. We can sometimes end up trading away the eternal for something very, very temporary. And in doing that, we end up despising our birthright. The second thing I think Esau did is that he exaggerated his reality. I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. How many have had kids say that to us over the years? How many have said that ourselves over the years? How many said that last night? In all likelihood, Esau was not, <laughs> he wasn't going to drop dead on the spot from hunger. In all likelihood, you know, there was probably, in this big family encampment of many tents, there was probably other food elsewhere that he could have found. Esau had other alternatives. But his exaggeration of his condition led him to grab hold of the very first appealing thing that he saw, the very first appealing thing he came across. Sometimes we can see our situation in life as hopeless. 
We feel like we're backed into a corner with no alternatives. So, so we grab hold of the first thing that we, we, we feel can help, even if it costs us our future. And so a young lady feels that she has no other way. So she gives up her birthright to be a mom and has an abortion. A young man has tried everything he can to find work with no success, and with hardly any money left, he gives up his birthright of living a life of integrity, perhaps even gives up his freedom so that he can go work for the gang leader and begin to sell drugs and rob people. Now you might be saying these situations, or maybe even the situation you find yourself in is not comparable to Esau. I mean, think about it. Selling your birthright for a bowl of stew? That's just silly. But you may be surprised at what you're capable of if you find yourself backed up against the wall. You may even give up part of your birthright. And that's why you need to understand here and now, before things get tough, that there's always another way. That there's always alternatives. You don't have to take that first alternative that comes along, especially if that alternative involves something that will cause you to give up a part of yourself, to give up a part of who you are in Christ. Now, it probably won't be easy. There may be a lot of short-term pain, but the long-term gain will be worth it. Be patient. Look for the Lord's hand guiding you through those seemingly hopeless situations. Don't do anything you would regret. Don't despise your birthright. Now Esau settled for a bowl of stew because it satisfied his physical needs at the time. That was his main focus. That was his only focus. Now granted, sometimes physical demands can be all-encompassing. Pain can be all-encompassing. But in this case, his, the physical demands of his body completely blinded Esau to, to any other considerations, any, any moral considerations, any spiritual considerations, any considerations of the responsibility of a firstborn. All he thought about were physical considerations. It's hard to focus on a birthright that's intangible. A birthright without total whose total fulfillment might be just way off in the future. When right now, our perception of our deepest need is, is, is so temporal, so based on material things, so tangible, we can reach out and touch it. Again, it's a matter of clearly understanding what really matters. And it's something we have to decide now before we're faced with the choice of what to do with our birthright. Your birthright your ability to have unbroken relationship with God, your ability to make use of the gifts and talents God has given you, your, excuse me, your unfailing knowledge that he has created you for a purpose. These are the things that really, really matter in life, much more than the material, the temporal, physical. Focus on what really matters. Don't despise your birthright. For in the end, that's what Esau did. He despised his birthright. Now, this was something that was brewing in his life for a long time. He didn't just wake up one morning and suddenly decide he would come to the place where he, he would sell the most valuable thing he owned for a bowl of stew. No, this was the result of, of years of not considering his birthright to be important, of not considering it to be val as valuable as other things in life. His hunting skills, well, they had made him self-sufficient. He loved going out, no, nothing better than he loved going out in the woods and hunting. He would be perfectly happy to do that for the rest of his life, and he could look after himself just fine. Who needed a birthright? Sometimes we can let our relationship with God grow cold to the point where it's not really the most important thing in our lives anymore. Maybe it doesn't even crack the top five. Or there are those in our society whose awareness that God wants a relationship with them and has created them for a purpose doesn't register them with them at all. It's like a zero on the meter. And to them, this birthright we, we speak of is of little or no value. We might begin to see ourselves as totally self-sufficient. And through lack of gratitude, we fail to see that 
that any and all of the gifts and the talents and the blessings that we have come from the Lord. We might get so discouraged by the events of our lives that we begin to doubt that there, there is a purpose to this life. Life begins to seem meaningless, and as Thoreau wrote, we begin to live lives of quiet desperation. For any or all of these reasons, people can begin to reason that perhaps their birthright isn't really worth the sacrifice, isn't really worth holding on to. So they despise their birthright and they let it go. But we can't let go of our birthright, our ability to connect with God, our realization of blessings and talents as gifts from God, our understanding that we are here for a purpose. We can't let go of those things without there being some impact on our lives. And more often than not, we can reach a point where we look back at the impact, look back on our lives with a sense of regret. And we wonder what our life has been for. We look at our decisions, you know, the seemingly insignificant small decisions to let go of a small part of who we are, a small part of what God has made us to be. We look at these accumulated small decisions over the course of time and we wonder, how did we get so off track? So we put on masks to hide the pain. We display an external satisfaction with how our life has gone and yet inside we realize that we've traded our birthright for something that wasn't worth it. The trade-off may have made sense at the time, especially if we didn't value our birthright from God. But now we realize that we were only focused on the short term. We didn't consider the long-term consequences. The trade-off seemed appealing and sweet, but now we realize that it was only candy-coated. What was inside wasn't worth it. So what do we do? Maybe you're here and you're living with decisions made years ago that you now wish you could undo. You wonder if your birthright is gone for good. Maybe you're here and you're just at the beginning of making all sorts of life decisions and and you've never really considered that idea that God has given you a birthright and that decisions made now will affect that birthright. (coughs) If you're in that second group of people, then hold on to that birthright. Don't give it up. Whether it's for a million dollars or for a bowl of stew. Your relationship with God, the blessings he's given you to use to bless others, the purpose he has for your life, these are all your birthright. Part of who you really are, the core of your being. Anything that loosens your grip on any of those things is not worth the trade-off. The problem is that sometimes the imbalance of the trade-off is not immediately obvious. And this is where we need to guard our heart. Protect what God has placed in you. Don't trade it away. Examine your motivations. Examine your heart. Examine your aspirations. Examine the choices before you by the light of God's word and by the direction of his Holy Spirit. Hold on to your birthright. And if you're here today and you feel like you sold your birthright, allow Jesus to redeem you. Allow Jesus to buy it back for you. Allow him to restore his purpose and his direction in your life. You can't have those years back, but Jesus can renew the years that are ahead of you. And he can bring restoration and healing from the pain of those years past so that you can move forward in newness of life, bring a whole new sense of restoration to what happened in the past. If you welcome him into your life, if you ask him for forgiveness for despising your birthright and ask him to restore you, he will do that. He will walk with you every step of the way and help help him help you know him more. He will give you a sense of purpose. He will give you a confidence that your gifts and abilities can be used the way that God intended for them to be used. Their heads bowed and eyes closed before the Lord. 
maybe you're here today and and the Lord is the Lord is reminding you about parts of your birthright you may have let go of over the years. When the devil reminds you of that, he brings shame. And he wants you to beat yourself up for it. But when the Lord reminds you of that, it's because he wants to bring healing. He wants to wrap you in his love. He wants to forgive you. And wants to begin to help you and work it in your life to put the pieces back together again. So that you can move forward in the birthright that he's given you. Don't let the enemy try to intrude on this time and make you feel ashamed. The Lord wants to restore. The Lord wants to heal. The Lord wants to forgive. And the Lord wants to help us get a better sense of what that birthright is so that we don't make decisions in the future that we will regret. Take some time in silence before the Lord. Talk to him. Lay before him the heavy burdens you're feeling, the regret you might be feeling. And let him speak into your spirit his mercy and his grace and his restoring power and his love. Take a moment and make this personal in your life. Father, thank you for the birthright that you've given to each and every one of us to be able to know you, to be able to use our gifts and abilities for your honor and glory, to know that we were created for a purpose. I thank you for the unique gift, birthright you've given to each person in this room that's different from everybody else, the unique way you're working in their lives. And Father, for any ways that we may have despised that birthright in the past and made decisions that have moved away from who we really are and who you've created us to be, Father, please forgive us. And Father, please restore. Restore the years the locusts have eaten away. Bring healing, bring restoration, bring forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to move forward in the birthright that you've given us. Help us, Lord, to examine all the choices and decisions we have to make in life in the light of the birthright that you've given us. I pray that the story of Esau would speak to us as a warning, not a warning of condemnation, but a warning of loving father gives to his children because he wants the best for them. Thank you, Lord, for each person in this room. Thank you, Lord, for the, the healing work you've done in each of their lives. Thank you for the healing work you're doing even this minute. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to do that, that we would be able to live out in as much fullness as flawed humans can 
the birthright that you've given us and live out the purpose that you've placed us here on this earth for. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll mask up and then I'll lead you out. This week, before you go, this week, may you gain a, a, more and more of a sense of the birthright you have. And may it become more and more valuable to you than it ever has before, so that it will influence your decisions. And that you can help those in your circle of influence make proper decisions to guard their birthright as well. May God bless you this week. We're going to file out like it's a wedding. So Denise, lead us up to everybody in the middle aisle. Once Denise is gone.